Uh, my chapter, as, as Deepak said, is uh, trying to provide uh, missing historical background uh, to Asian drama. Uh, Asian drama, as uh, most of you will know, and as Deepak said, is a huge, is a huge book, a 2,300 pages spread over three volumes. But uh, Murdoch then never bothered with any historical background. He more or less jumped into the story at the time of, uh, at the time of uh, Indian independence uh, uh, in the late 40s and, uh, and then carried on with the story from 1968, <clears throat> from 1968 onwards. Uh, so what uh, I do in my chapter for the, for the second volume of the, Deepak, of the Naya study uh, is to provide a sort of missing historical background chapter. So this chapter has the benefit of hindsight and also uh, uh, gives one the possibility of uh, trying to fill in the blanks and uh, give a broader perspective on the background that Murdahl uh, discussed in his, uh, in his, uh, in his book. Uh, so, all right, so let me get, uh, get down to the, to the substance of, the ch of, uh, of my chapter. Uh, <clears throat> the opening section of the chapter is, uh, the, the title of the opening section uh, is Malthus, Muslims, and Mongols, all right? So I got a little carried away with, uh, with three Ms and uh, Malthus, Muslims, and Mongols seem like a nice way to start. Uh, so why would you, why, why would I do that? What's Malthus got to do with it anyway, right? Well, one question I like to ask my students at the beginning of any of my development lectures in Colombia is, uh, why, why do you think that one third of humanity is either Indian or Chinese, right? So every, uh, everybody knows that, well, there's lots of Indians, there's lots of Chinese, you add them up, and they're about one third of the total human race. Uh, this is true today, it was true 500 years ago, it was true 1,000 years ago, probably 2,000 years ago, roughly, roughly speaking, all right? Third of humanity is either Indian or Chinese, right? So why is that? And I wait for the answer from, from my students, and usually the good students will come up first, and they'll say something like river valleys, all right? And of course, river valleys is the answer. The, the Indus and the Ganges in India, uh, the, the, the Yangtze, Yangtze and the Yellow River in China, these are these great river valleys that provide the, you know, the flow, the, 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 the deposits of silt, and uh, the banks of these rivers uh, very fertile, provide very fertile ground for agriculture. All right, so this naturally uh, gives gives an advantage uh, to uh, to product agricultural production, and therefore to uh, to population to population growth. Uh, so in the Malthus uh, model, the Malthus Ricardo classical model of economic growth. Uh, population is endogenous, all right? Unlike modern economics where you simply take population as given. So if popu how is population endogenous? Well, Malthus basically says that fertility is an uh, increasing function of per capita income. Mortality is a decreasing function of per capita income. Uh, so where the two, uh, where these two functions cross, you can think of as giving, as, as determining a level of per capita income, let's call it little y star, uh, where little y star is the equilibrium, the, the level of per capita income that equates the fertility and mortality and therefore at which population will be constant, all right? So we can think of uh, for India, uh, determine the y star for India, for China, determine the y star for China, but then a little y star is just the per capita income, right? It's not the total, it's not the total population of the total GDP. Uh, so to get that, we just, you know, we can, I'll ask you to do some mental geometry, not mental arithmetic. Mental geometry, you have the, you have uh, GDP on the vertical axis, uh, labor or population which are proportional to each other on the horizontal axis. So little y star can be thought of as a ray through the origin, right? And then uh, uh, since out given land and technology, uh, out, 
GDP is an increasing function of the labor force, but with diminishing returns, all right? So uh, eventually the production function will cross the, this Y star array through the origin, and that will determine uh, the level of uh, labor force and therefore population, as well as GDP, all right? And since you have the Ganges and the Indus in the case of India and the Yangtze and the Yellow River in the case of China, you have lots of land, you have you know, the, the best technology that was available at that time, and so you get big GDPs and big population for both India and China, all right? So that, that's, let's start with that's the underlying sort of structural base of, uh, for, for Asian uh, history, right? That you have these two big giants. Of course, there are many other countries that, uh, that uh, Deepak went through, and each of them, of course, deserves, will get its due, due uh, attention in the course of our study. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's inevitable that the story is going to be dominated somewhat by these, these two giants, all right? China, China, and uh, China and India. Uh, so China and India were so dominant that, uh, that Karl Marx, when he wrote Das Kapital, uh, was uh, thought of them as constituting a peculiar mode of production. He says, and they, as most of you will know, uh, in the West, uh, he thought that uh, the society pro pro uh, you know, progressed through the stages of the ancient mode of production based on slavery, the medieval mode of production based on feudalism, and then capitalism, all right? But in Asia, he said you had what he called the Asiatic mode of production, all right? Where you, for these big river valleys, the floods have to be controlled, so the state plays an important role in, uh, in controlling irrigation, and this leads to what uh, he called the, uh, the Asiatic mode of production, and what Karl Wittfogel after him called uh, Oriental despotism, all right? Because the water has to be controlled, so you need a powerful state, and the powerful state uh, sort of dominates the society, and you don't have, uh, you don't have you have prosperity, you have you know, GDP at a high level because you have this, but you have a big population and uh, you don't get a driving force of you know, feudalism and competition between feudal lords and things like that that you find in Western history. So in Asian history, you have this underlying stability, all right? So this concept of an Asiatic mode was heavily criticized both by non-Marxists as well as Marxists. And more recently, people speak about the tributary mode of production, all right? Where uh, to administer this big GDP and big population and big labor force, uh, you need a central administration dominated by, let us say, the emperor and his court. And there's an, uh, he needs an, uh, to support him, he needs an army and a bureaucracy. The bureaucracy is partly at the center. The army and the bureaucracy are partly at the center, but partly also dispersed around the various regions to provide protection and also to ensure law and order and the prompt payment of taxes, all right? So that constitutes the tributary mode. Right? And of course, these, each dynasty is not necessarily stable uh, because uh, the provincial officials can think, you know, why should we submit, uh, submit uh, the tribute uh, to, the, uh, to the center? Why can't we retain some of it for ourselves? And so then you get, comp you, you get uh, conflict between the center and, uh, and the provinces and some provincial governor or some foreign invader may take advantage of the situation and overthrow the dynasty, all right? So you get this dynastic cycle. But then the new ruler, the new emperor, uh, will start a new dynasty, but then the new, he himself or his dynasty will be subject to the same forces, all right? So in the end, uh, you get a repetition of these things. In China, you have, during the last millennium, last thousand years, you had the Song Dynasty, which was a native Chinese dynasty. It was replaced by the Mongol Yuan Dynasty, uh, which in turn was replaced by the native Chinese Ming Dynasty, and then another uh, sort of nomadic uh, Central Asian uh, dynasty, uh, that of the Manchus. All right? So you have this succession of, uh, of empires, uh, but with the same underlying structure and function. Right? Uh, so so this, this provides uh, uh, the basis, the continuing basis uh, for, for Asian history. 
Uh, now, of course, uh, you, you had the trade was not uh, was. We tend to think of trade as more or less coming with the modern world, but trade did exist uh, at that time. Uh, through the volume was limited, but nevertheless, and because of the high transport costs, you had to you had to have uh, it had to be in very valuable commodities. So the valuable commodities, of course, were silks and spices from Asia that the West needed very much, and which traveled uh, uh, traveled west along the Silk Road overland, which is the overland route, and through the sea lanes uh, from the Indonesian islands through the Straits of, through the Straits of Malacca into the Red Sea. And then, the, you know, the Egyptian sultan in Cairo and the Venetian uh, traders in, with their base in Alexandria uh, would, uh, would haggle over the price and the profits, right? So, but this very, uh, very, uh, very uh, lucrative uh, Asian trade was practiced for many hundreds of, many hundreds of years, right? Uh, <clears throat> so... Uh, but then the, uh, the Mongols were, uh, have to be brought into the picture. So Central Asia, which we, we can divide Asia into South Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia, and Central Asia. The Mongols, of course, were sort of pastoral herdsmen from Central Asia, but their mode of existence, depending on horses and using the, the bow, uh, gave them this military striking power. And they used this military striking power to dominate, uh, you know, uh, the whole uh, whole of Eurasia up to the, up, up to China and to the borders of Russia, of course. Uh, so the Pax Mongolica uh, stimulated overland trade, stimulated uh, stimulated uh, the flow of you know, westward flow of silk, and not only of silk, but you know, other Chinese techniques and so on. Uh, that uh, the great uh, British historian Joseph Needham uh, 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 d discussed in his in his book on science and civilization in China. So this was the the route through which uh, East and West were connected. It was an early example of globalization, right? And we don't we don't think of the Mongols, but you know you need peace along these ways. And when you have an empire, we we are familiar with the Pax Britannica. But before the Pax Britannica, you had the Pax Mongolica, right? The the the, the Mongol peace that try, that uh, stimulated the the, the the westward flow of trade. Uh, so uh, you have the succession of dynasties then in China that I mentioned earlier. It's uh, you know in the in the chapter I go into the transition from one, one to the other, but here I have no time uh, to do that. Uh, but then the <clears throat> the important uh, the important thing is to is to uh, is to realize that uh, dis despite this succession of empires, uh, what was happening was that the underlying structure. The underlying structure was remaining uh, was remaining very uh, very much the same, but all of this much of this changed with the European intrusion. All right, the European intrusion came at the end of the 15th century, as we all know. And uh, why did Vasco da Gama uh, show up in uh, in Indian waters? Uh, well, he wanted the idea was to outflank Venice. All right, to sail around the Cape of Cape of Good Hope, uh, control. Uh, Malacca, which, the, which is the, the straits through which the, the, the eastern spices had to pass. And there was this Portuguese saying that the Lord of Malacca has his hand on the throat of Venice. Right? So that was the stimulus for the Portuguese, for the Portuguese intrusion. All right? But then, of course, the Portuguese were followed by the English and the Dutch. And, uh, and then we have, uh, but then the land-based empires, the Mughal Empire in India, the the Ming and later the Qing Empire in China, they were very powerful land-based empires, all right? And it was not easy for the West to overthrow them. So the West basically was on the periphery of making profitable trade, but not intruding into the, but not intruding into the, but not intruding into the center. Uh, but all of this changed, of course, with the advent of uh, technology. Uh, the Industrial Revolution brought the steam engine, the steamboat, and this meant that uh, the, the West could uh, more effectively intrude into the land-based power of the Asian, of the Asian states, right? And the best illustration of this, of course, is the Opium Wars, all right? 
So as we know that uh, because of the, uh, the activities of the East India Company, the East India Company could, uh, could get opium from, it had a monopoly on opium in Bengal. It would sell this uh, Bengal opium in China. Uh, perch, uh, instead of using up valuable silver, it could, use, it could, uh, it could uh, export the Indian opium. In return, you would get tea and porcelain. Uh, the tea, and then the, this could be shipped back to, uh, to England. So one asked, there was this trade triangle between, between India, China, and Britain. Uh, so who got what? And, and you know, in, in my normal life, I teach the theory of international trade, how everybody gains, and from all these three countries, everyone, should, of course, should have been better off. But if we ask historically under the, those circumstances, who got what, right? Well, we, uh, it's... Uh, yeah. Uh, we can we can say that uh, that what the, that the, the Chinese got Indian opium, uh, and the British got Chinese tea, and chi and the teacups. The as, as you know, the English word for for porcelain is China, right? China with a small c, all right. So you get the tea and the China from China uh, to drink the tea, and then what do the what do the Indians get? As uh, somebody said, well, the Indians got Queen Victoria and the British Raj, all right? So that, that, that was the closing, that was the closing, that was the closing, of the, the closing of the triangle. Because what the East India Company ended up doing was because of the Industrial Revolution, the machine-made Lancashire textiles could be sent to India, and uh, that destroyed the handloom weavers in India. And uh, so, and it, of course, I mean, Robert Clive and so on had already made intrusions into India, but after the, after the Industrial Revolution by the 19th century, uh, the British takeover was, was complete. Uh, okay, so that is, uh, <coughs> that's, uh, that's the sequence uh, by which, uh, <coughs> by which uh, uh, the, Asian, the Asian empires, which resisted for so long, uh, we're finally to more to, to to a large extent subjugated. Ron, right? that's 15 minutes. Huh? Okay, so I'll, I'll just take a couple of minutes more. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> so uh, so uh, the British continued uh, uh, continued their rule in India. In, in China, there was the informal rule. I mean, the uh, Chinese was still technically sovereign, but the British got Hong Kong and uh, all these tre une so-called unequal treaties were imposed on China. Uh, so uh, as a result, uh, we could say that, uh, that, uh, that, that, and then meanwhile, of course, the Dutch had all, also in, intruded into, into, into Indonesia. Uh, so you had the, the, the European colonial control over most of Asia by the 19th century, all right? Then if we look at per capita income, just coming back to the Malthusian theme, as a result of the work of Madison and various other people, we have per capita income statistics for hundreds of years. And if we look at them, the remarkable thing is that China under the Song Dynasty in the 11th century seemed to have been at least as prosperous, if not more prosperous, in terms of per capita income than she was in the middle of the 19th century, all right? And even by, by so for, for the entire period, the entire thousand years from the, from the 11th century to the middle of the 20th century, per capita income really didn't, uh, didn't change, either in China or in India, all right? So it's remarkable that this Malthusian mechanism kept per capita income at a steady level. It didn't mean there was no change, all right? There was lots of change. For example, the new, when the British brought, when the Europeans brought the New World silver and other, other materials, uh, and, the, and what they brought also were the food plants, all right, potatoes and maize and uh, peanuts and things like that. And this, of course, gave a great stimulus to, to agricultural production, but it got all swallowed up in population expansion. And so you had bigger GDP, bigger population, but per capita, per capita income uh, did not change. So all of that remained the same until the middle of the 19th century when you had the independence uh, movements uh, in uh, the Communist uh, Party in China, the Indian National Congress in India, and other national, nationalist movements in Southeast Asia reestablished uh, Asian independence. And then, of course, now we come to the initial to 1968 and the beginning of the Murdoch story, and that's the point at which I'll stop. Thank you.